Good morning, everyone. I'm Flynn. I'm one of the second years. I'm currently on AT, and then we're talking about uh, gastrointestinal stromal, stromal tumors today. Nope, that's wrong. Sorry, guys. Already technically challenged here. Okay. Um, so just some basic background information. This occurs, um, the incidence of GIST is about 0.78 in 100,000 patients. There's about 5,000 new cases in the U.S. annually and anywhere from like 3 to 20 million uh, annually in the world. It's the most common sarcoma subtype, and it's found in men about as often as it is in women, except in the pediatric population. There's actually a female predominance to GIST. Typically, you'll see this in an elderly population around 50 to 70 years old, and it can occur anywhere in the GI tract um, from the stomach or esophagus all the way down to the rectum. It's most commonly found in the stomach, however, um, and the next most common site would be the small intestine. This is a mesenchymal cancer classically described as a spindle cell neoplasm of smooth muscle origin. It arises from the interstitial cells of Cajal, which are the pacemaker cells of uh, the GI tract. And this is why it can be found anywhere along the whole GI tract. Typically, um, most patients that have a GIST will not have any symptoms, but those who do become symptomatic uh, usually do so further along in the course of their disease. It can cause early satiety or nausea and vomiting or dysphagia, especially if it's in the esophagus or the stomach higher up in the GI tract. It can also cause vague abdominal discomfort. Patients can have GI bleed or fatigue uh, secondary to the anemia from that GI bleed. And then um, in rare but more extreme cases, patients can present with an acute abdomen or uh, acute obstruction. So imaging is really important for both the initial diagnosis and the workup and staging of just um, if you you would first start with an EGD um, to try to visualize a tumor on EGD. And if you do see a tumor, it'll most likely be a smooth submucosal tumor. It's not like ulcerating into the mucosa compared to other um, cancers in the GI tract. Um, <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, they do ulcerate, but it's usually over like a dome of, of that's my understanding. It's a domed nodule with an ulceration in the center as opposed to like an invagination in the mucosa. At least that's what I had um, read about. Um, if you do see something suspicious on EGD, even for workup of other conditions, um, you can get a EUS with FNA to sample uh, the tumor and then send that to pathology. Um, once you do get a diagnosis of GIST, all patients should get a CT abdomen, pelvis, and or an MRI to help with staging and surgical planning. Um, and if it's less than two centimeters in size, you can stick to just those imaging studies, but the NCCN recommends a chest CT for any tumors larger than that. Um, on CT scan, these are usually again, smooth, um, about the same density as regular soft tissue. You can see in um, the top right-hand corner there, there's, let me see if I can get my mouse to go over there, uh, a, a tumor here with a central ulceration. Um, and then additionally for workup and staging, you get a PET CT just to see if there's any metastatic um, as well. They can also help you determine which parts of the tumor are active and which parts might be necrotic or um, inactive scar. And then I just included here, this is called the Torricelli Bernoulli sign that is um, often seen in GIST on CT scan. It's this central necrosis with an air fluid level. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so what's most important in treating uh, GISTs is the genotyping. 
Um, so most GISTs express CD117 or KIT is about 75 to 80 percent of all GISTs. The KIT receptor is a receptor tyrosine kinase, which um, some of this stuff just seems really down into the weeds, but it's actually really important in managing it. So you have this extracellular domain of uh, the KIT receptor that's coded by exon 9, and that's most often seen in uh, intestinal GISTs. And there's the juxta membrane domain, which is encoded by exon 11, and that's the most common mutation that you'll find is the exon 11 mutation, and that is found across the GI tract. And then you have your two tyrosine kinase domains here encoded by exons 13 and 17, and those mutations are actually really rare, and I don't really talk about them much more after this. Um, the second most common mutation is the PDGFRA mutation. It's another receptor tyrosine kinase with similar um, intracellular domains. It has the juxta membrane here encoded by exon 12 and then the two tyrosine kinase domains. The most common for the PDGFRA is exon 18. Um, and notably, there is a specific mutation within exon 18 called D842V, um, which again becomes important. I'll talk about it later when I talk about medical treatment. Um, sometimes just have neither of these uh, receptors, and these are deemed wild type gists. There are additional genetic studies that you can get to determine what subtype of wild type gist it is. Some of these are SDH deficient or associated with BRAF exon 15 mutations or KROS and NF1, which I think of all the things on this slide might be the most recognizable gene mutations. They're also um, commonly positive for CD34 antigen. These are just some examples of staining for CD117 and PDGFRA. You can see the positive ones up here and the negative ones down here. If you complete these stains and both are negative and you're highly suspicious that this could be a gist, um, the next stain you can use is the DOG1 stain. It's a calcium regulated chloride channel that's often positive um, in gists even when CD117 and PDGFRA are, are negative. Um, something about of GIST, <laughs> diagnosis of GIST. <laughs> um, okay, and then I kind of alluded to this already, but there's additional genetic studies that you can obtain, um, oftentimes just as associated with neurofibromatosis one. And then there's these two diseases I'd never heard of before, Carney's triad or Carney's trichakis syndrome. Um, which you commonly see gists and paragangliomas in. Uh, Carney's triad has the addition of pulmonary chondromas as well, and these are pretty rare. Um, less commonly, you can also see these in von Hippel Lindau syndrome. Okay, so the staging of gist, um, I just drew this straight from NCCN guidelines, but just to focus in on a couple of things. The T stage is determined by the size of the tumor. And then the end stage is determined by whether or not there are nodal metastasis. It's a black or white. You either have them or you don't, um, which is different than a lot of the other cancers we talk about. And it's the same with metastatic disease. You either have metastatic disease or you don't. Um, what, what on that piece of paper very busy What matters? So what matters here is that in any N1 positive disease is stage four disease. And this is different. Very rarely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. The second line is that uh, this the non gastric gists are staged, they're upstaged compared to gastric gists. So the same tumor characteristics will cause a higher stage in a non gastric gist compared to a gastric gist. And that's kind of what the yellow highlights there. One thing you have you not talked about at all on that slide is the grading. So yeah, I'm going to get into the grading a little bit more, but the grading for GIST is dependent on the mitotic rate. So it's considered low grade if it's less than five mitoses per 50 high power field and high grade if it's greater than five mitoses per uh, 50 high power field. Yeah, and so my point is that all that matters is how big the tumor is and what the grade is. If it's red, that's a different factor. Yes, sir. Yeah. So as Dr. Vreeland said, the thing that matters most is the size and the mitotic rate. 
And you can use these two features of an individual patient's tumor to determine their, uh, the biologic behavior of their GIST. So um, you can see here, the left table is gastric GIST and right table is non-gastric GIST. Um, I highlighted in yellow those that are low grade, so less than five mitoses per uh, high power field. And you can see that for the same size and mitotic rate, the gastric GIST, met, let, let's do a specific example here. So for this smaller GIST right here, low grade, um, two to five centimeters, the metastatic rate is 1.9. For the same size and mitotic rate in a non-gastric GIST, um, it's higher, or this is a better example. So this is low grade with a 3.6 metastatic rate. The same size tumor that's not in the stomach is a 24% uh, chance of metastasis. And so this is really important when uh, working the patient up and prognosticating. Um, their risk of recurrence is also determined by um, the size and the mitotic rate. So here you can see that smaller tumors with a low mitotic rate have a low or very low risk of recurrence and larger tumors with a higher mitotic rate have an intermediate or high risk of recurrence. And this is important when determining medical therapy, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, tumor rupture, I just put this here to remind myself, tumor rupture is also it intraoperatively will increase your risk of recurrence. This is the nomogram that was created by Memorial Sloan Kettering um, to discuss um, recurrence-free survival with patients. Um, and it assigns a point value to size, mitotic index, and site, and then that total point value you can use after. So as an example, if you have a five centimeter tumor, you're, that gives you 30 points. Um, if it's a low grade, you add zero to that. And if it's, let's say in the colon or well, the stomach, you add zero to that. So their total point value would be 30. Um, and then you go straight down from 30 here to determine their probability of recurrence free survival. So for uh, a five centimeter uh, low grade gist in the stomach, you could tell them that they have a pretty high chance of um, recurrence free survival in the first two years, almost 100%, it's off the chart here. And then at five years, about 90%. Okay, now the fun stuff, surgery. Um, most uh, gists can be watched if they are small and asymptomatic. So you can follow these patients longitudinally with uh, clinic visits um, and I think you can, so, <laughs> okay, fair. So I think you can just ignore them if they're small and asymptomatic in the beginning. If you, if you happen to know that a patient has a small gist, most of these people are cult clinically. You wouldn't even know that they have one. Surveil, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. The first statement of the surgical management is just like the doctor that you can watch. Okay. The other one, too, is if you have a patient who's like, like, <coughs> Very small symptomatic gist. Some of these are amenable to endoscopic resection, but for the most part, we'll do a segmented or wedge resection of anything larger than two centimeters. And the key is to resect to negative gross margins uh, while maintaining the tumor capsule because tumor rupture um, will increase your risk of recurrence down the line. And then the endoscopic I guess 
that's my point is that adaptive gifts is really, really easy to set up. Mm -hmm. So just set them up. Okay. And then, yes, then you then you can say, well, okay, set it up. Take home point just set it up. So easy to do. Okay. Don't let the AI talk to you like crazy Okay. Um, if you send off your specimen to pathology and they call you back and they say that microscopically your margins are positive, you don't have to go back and, and re resect to negative margins for these. Um, you also don't have to complete a lymphadenectomy at the time of surgery as lymph node metastasis is incredibly rare in these. Um, the caveat uh, being in SDH deficient gists, that enlarged node should be resected. And then minimally invasive approaches are becoming more and more common. Um, they decrease bleeding and hospital stay um, and patient outcomes. So um, you'll see these done laparoscopically um, a lot of the time. Patients should be considered for neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, or medical therapy if it's going to change your surgery. So if um, the tumor is near, is in the esophagus and giving preoperative therapy will allow you to do an esophagus sparing surgery or a less morbid surgery, then you should consider giving neoadjuvant medical therapy. Um, and if giving it will allow you to spare a sphincter, then that's another time that uh, neoadjuvant medical therapy can be considered. Um, and if a patient's known to have isolated metastasis, you can remove isolated mets at the time of your surgery as well if they're resistant to preoperative medical treatment. Yeah, the other comment there is that neoadjuvant is that a lot of shifts are Um, the mainstay of medical therapy for GIS is imatinib or Gleevec. It's a selective inhibitor of the kit uh, protein tyrosine kinases. And as I mentioned, it can be given both neoadjuvantly or in the adjuvant setting. Um, typically, it's given at a dose of about four of exactly 400 milligrams daily. Um, specifically in the exon 11 mutation, these patients uh, respond really well to this dosing. Um, and in the adjuvant setting, it's given for typically a period of three years or uh, after surgery. There, I think there's studies trying to figure out if longer duration corresponds to improved um, recurrence-free survival. Like one year, right? One year with this, mm -hmm. one year with three, three years better, and that people stay in five years, three, three years, people think they want to tolerate it really well. So it's an interesting phenomenon. It's kind of similar with other estrogen receptors. Uh, the other important distinction is when you get your genotyping, if they do have an exon 9 mutation in the C-kit, these patients respond um, better to double the dose, so 400 twice daily instead of once daily. Um, sometimes patients do develop a resistance to Gleevec, uh, which is defined as clinical progression which, within the first six months of therapy. Um, specifically, you'll see this a lot in the, the exon 18 uh, D842V mutation. So if you have a patient on Gleevec and they're not responding, consider getting this genotyping study to see if that's why they're resistant. Um, if they're wild type, they're all also more likely to develop imatinib resistance. And then as mentioned, if they're exon 9 and you're only giving them a once daily dose, um, they might show uh, resistance and you'll double them. Um, if it's been greater than six months that they're on therapy and they have secondary resistance to imatinib, you can either escalate their dose to 800 milligrams a day or change agents. Drug 
company develops a specific drug that blocks that mutation, that's the only thing it does. So it's like a very rare thing that some drug company is able to develop a drug against it and they ran a trial and it worked. And so now that is FDA approved for that, for the H42B mutation exists. That's the only mutation for that drug. So interesting, that's sort of where I think medicine is going. Yeah, um, an alternative agent besides Gleevec is the sunitinib. It's another multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor that can control, control progressive disease, especially in patients with matinib resistance. And this is usually a better first-line agent for the SDH-deficient wild-type gists um, and also shows a higher response rate in the exon 9 and, uh, as compared to the exon 11 KIP mutation. And then that, I don't know if that, I, I don't know how to say this, I'm sorry, avapritinib is the one you're referring to. Yeah, That's yeah. FDA approved only for uh, the exon 18 d 42 b mutation. Um, and then these were just some other of the um, drugs that were listed in NCCN as suggested alternatives to imatinib and uh, sinitinib. And I, maybe this is common knowledge, but I actually didn't know this, so I'm going to share this tidbit, is that the nibs are all kinase inhibitors and the tinibs are all tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which maybe this is very obvious, but I didn't know any of these. Um, and then the fenibs are, or the rafinibs are um, BRAF enzyme inhibitors. That's the monoclonal antibodies, right? So there will always be an aspect question where the only thing you need to know to get it right um, so I mentioned you can give these before surgery as a, in the neoadjuvant setting. So then how do you determine when to go to surgery? Um, patients can be surveilled with CT, abdomen, pelvis, or MRI every eight to 12 weeks to determine if they're responding to treatment and um, the maximal response to treatment is defined as no improvement between two successive scans. And that's when you can start your surgical planning, determine if now they're resectable. Um, you can also use PET to evaluate the efficacy of your um, new adjuvant therapy if you need a rapid readout in two to four weeks after starting uh, therapy. You can do it sooner than that. Okay. Why is that done? Why is that so important? Why is that early pet activity Because you have the opportunity to change your medical therapy if it's not. I'm not sure. I, I assume it takes a while. So that, that's why it matters. Is that you know, and, and, and again, it's like the field is changing, and now we're doing rotational analysis on, on the mode, so we would order it right away. But it used to be that like we didn't know that much about the different exons, and it wasn't really. Realistic thing that you can get that back quickly, quickly enough to decide what therapy to do. So the old thing to do, and probably what we all still do, is you're like, that's a really ugly gist. They need your address. You give them that, and that's it. And then a week later, you scan them. And if they're not responding, then you double the dose of that. If they're still not responding, then you're like, oh, it's got to be something crazy. But now we can get, you know, the exon analysis, but you can still start feedback right away. And if it takes pathology three weeks to get you the result, you can already have your answer about whether or not. But the other reason too is like a lot of times the patients maybe the white people respond to it doesn't predict it 100 percent right? even like in the wild you need a response you're still gonna try the time I think it's really helpful is you're like I could expect this now if it progresses I probably or I may not be able to if it responds that would be even better 
you need to make a decision of like, you know, I'm going to go one of two ways, but I got to make a decision very soon. Um, then, you know, it's helpful to know that this isn't going to respond to that. And then the, the it's interesting, the new management, it's like it, it will respond for six months to a year fairly reliably. So it, it tends to be like a steady response, and then it, the years for you know, some period of time can start to progress. And that's why the teacher says it can. You know, like, okay, we got to get out to a certain level anyway. Okay. Um, one thing I don't understand is it's like the new adjuvant data seems to suggest it's like fairly reliable will progress, whereas the uh, adjuvant data. Is it, I'm just not going to see it. Like, if it's, you know, in that algorithm, it's less than five, less than five, you're not going to treat it. I mean, it's only if it's in the, the basically for this incidental gadget ones are always less than five centimeters. Yeah. So this is all a little bit lower. Yeah, I'm going to ask that because we're probably not going to be using it. And up when do we have every single time it's like, okay, that's great. I think you had a high high Or at least. When you take it down. Or at point would be so like high grades so over head, head, the therapy would be okay. Then you would like, but again, yeah. I still wouldn't do like or add all the stuff. But if it can't be current, it's just going to act like it, it, it would only be able to apply if it's a lot. That's a shock. Yeah. Unlike <laughs> the I mean, this is like, you know, these gastric discs are like prostate cancer, or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're probably a lot of thyroid cancer. There's a lot of burden going out there. Mm -hmm. That's something. That's why I, the small ones you don't need to have sex. I want to get like basically incidentally discover. But like for the, the, the kind of going back to that, the 10th point, um, the ones that you know, in the NPC in it says, if you have like a five millimeter lane, it's just like that. Mm -hmm. There's only one way to scale it, like how many really calculate it. That's how you calculate it. You're like talking about, you know, 50 years of annual service, but that really doesn't have a gap in the range. So it's not like you have that long. It's not like that long. Yeah, and then, like that initial slide to the NPC guy that I was talking about, this size, this is my calculator, this is the size of the very rarely in any cancer literature can you see a zero in, in an algorithm like that. And if, if it's less than two centimeters and less than five metallic rate, you would see zero of a system that says it's long term. So those are the ones that you can get to like. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, there were there were some cadaver not cadaver autopsy studies that I think they were published out in like the 70s and 80s that showed that up to a quarter of people over age 60 have gists like that just went unnoticed. Yeah. Probably more in their don't, you know, yeah. Um, and then this is my last slide, uh, post-surgical surveillance. I don't like screen grabbing NCCM, but I, I really like this flow sheet. Um, so if they are um, low risk disease from that table I showed earlier, this one, um, and they're completely resected, uh, you can, oops, sorry, you can um, just follow them <clears throat> longitudinally. Um, if they need adjuvant uh, imatinib, especially if they have a high risk of recurrence or uh, if you left uh, positive margins, um, positive gross margins, uh, you'll give adjuvant imatinib. And yeah, this is the 
follow up for every three to six months of the first five years, especially for those who got new adjuvant uh, imatinib. Um, yeah. Oh, and then this bottom one here, it went on to another slide, but for persi persistent microscopic disease, so an R1 resection, or if you have gross residual disease, you'll just continue imatinib uh, as long as the patient can tolerate it for and follow them with Q three to six month scans for five years. And I included an abstract question, which you don't have time to go through. Right, right. So the I could truly only find one in, in terms of like absite relevant things. Um, I think that the the basics of that just is treated with imatinib. Um, if there's a, a higher risk of recurrence, that this is the only true one question I could find. If the tumor is large, so greater than five centimeters, or if mitotic rate is greater than five, you should. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, for non gastric gists, a smaller tumor um, with the same mitotic rate is has a higher risk of two and five. Yeah. Yeah. 